Hello, my name is Kate Crowley. I'm on the faculty in the program of Communication Sciences and Disorders at Teachers College, Columbia University. I have created these video modules with my co-author, Georgia Dwan. Welcome to Module 1 of Differential Diagnosis in Preschool Evaluations, a Case Study. This module series is intended to give evaluators a step-by-step -step approach of how to assess and evaluate a preschool age child based on current federal law, state regulations, ASHA guidelines, and evidence-based practice. I'm going to use an evaluation of a two-year, 10-month-old boy, we'll call him Alex, who is primarily exposed to English, but also has had some exposure to Spanish. In this module series, we walk through a full evaluation of Alex, beginning with the gathering of data through the final written evaluation report, along with IEP goals. We'll start with the parent interview and analyze prior evaluations and therapy goals. We'll watch my interactions with the child, and as we gather information about the child during the evaluation, we'll go through my analysis as I come up with a differential diagnosis. Finally, we'll organize and synthesize the data examples in the evaluation write-up and IEP goals. We will see how an evaluator gathers information from the parent and from the child, then applies the law, brings in the research, uses clinical judgment, and comes up with a differential diagnosis. In this first module, we'll look at the kinds of prior services Alex received before this evaluation. We will see that while Alex definitely needed therapy, his prior evaluations in therapy were incorrect. We can see the consequences of an inaccurate diagnosis, which can lead to inappropriate and insufficient speech services, and more importantly, the delay of services that are truly needed, particularly early intervention. I learned of this case when Alex's mother contacted me because she felt that he needed services which he was not getting. Alex had been evaluated twice before he came to see me, first when he was two years, three months old in English only, and again when he was two years, seven months old, this time in both English and Spanish. Here are some conclusions contained in the first evaluation. Two years, three months, English only. Jaw stability was reduced. It is recommended that Alex receive speech, language feeding, and oral motor therapy. Goals to be targeted. Alex will perform disassociated movements of the tongue, lips, and jaw. Result? Did not qualify for EI services from the New York State Department of Health. Here are some of the conclusions from the second evaluation. Two years, seven months, English and Spanish. He was observed to have pure, poor jaw stability and limited oral movements when talking. In connected speech, his speech intelligibility is significantly limited due to the presences of multiple phonological processes. Result, did not, did not qualify for EI services, but he was assigned an IEP for the preschool. After two full evaluations using standardized tests, Alex did not qualify for early intervention services. However, he was given an IEP on the basis of having articulation and jaw stabilization issues. When I saw Alex and looked at what his IEP goals were, I felt that it would be very unlikely for these to be appropriate goals given current research on non-speech oral motor exercises and what we would expect developmentally given his young age. For example, I did not see any problems with jaw disassociation and working on liquid sounds, R and L and SP cluster, cluster simplification were simply not appropriate for a child less than three years old. Developmentally, L and er sounds are not considered delayed until the child is six years old and the s until the child is seven or eight years old, let alone mo more developmentally advanced SP clusters. Despite two full evaluations and an IEP, his mother, as a preschool school psychologist, had an understanding of disordered and typical speech. I'll talk more about this in the second module and she contacted me because she felt there was something about her son's speech that was not being addressed. 
Based on the prior evaluations and diagnoses, it was determined that Alex did not qualify for early intervention services offered by the New York State Department of Health. In these video modules, you see how process of making the differential diagnosis for Alex, how it works. He did not have joy stabilization issues and his so-called articulation issues were actually the result of a motor planning deficit called developmental apraxia that requires an altogether different therapeutic approach, according to the research. If Alex had been given an appropriate diagnosis with, of developmental apraxia, he would have qualified for services. He did not get the appropriate diagnosis, and as a result, the private speech-language services that he received did not provide the services needed to address his disorder. To avoid what happened with Alex, we as evaluators must use a diverse toolkit of evaluation tasks to gather data about the child's abilities and to see where the skills break down. While the analysis we employ in this evaluation is specific to Alex, the process shows how an evaluator gathers the most telling data about the child's abilities. We'll see the process of the evaluator and we'll learn how to gather data from the parent and child, then pull things apart, analyze and synthesize them in the final product, the speech language evaluation and IEP goals. Please refer to Alex's evaluation and IEP goals on the Leaders Project website as we go through these evaluation modules. We start with the parent interview in the next module.